Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome at the Groninger Museum. My name is Andreas Blüm. I'm the happy director of this house. Happy today, especially for this wonderful occasion. Welcome you here in the gallery in JR Chronicle, in the exhibition, but also online. Millions of you, most welcome. We have distinguished guests. I'm going to introduce the two persons behind me. Um, happy to have you all here. JR in Groningen. Why? Um, of course, why not? I mean, good art is always for this museum, but there is a connection. Because when we were offered this show by the Brooklyn Museum in New York, we thought this is a chance also to remind our audience, the public inside, outside, that this museum has a long tradition of showing graffiti art. And JR has once started with graffiti art. We gave an impulse to new art. We also wanted to go beyond the museum walls to work and show and involve people outside the museum walls, and who is better equipped to help us with that than J.R. himself. I only want to point out one person here, Ali Middel Miklarok, distinguished pioneering woman graffiti artist, is in the gallery. <laughs> and behind me on my left side, Nadia Musaid, I don't need to introduce her to you. All people in Holland know her from many television performances, and she's an expert, and she actually she told us that she always wanted to invite JR to a show, but never managed, so ha, we brought JR to us, and I don't need to introduce, but I'm so happy to have you here, JR. Uh, finally, you couldn't come to the opening, and then there was a lockdown again, but now we have you here, and we're very pleased. Uh, we were delighted to have a little tour with you in the galleries already, and we learned a lot we didn't know before. Um, and now the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Yeah, so JR, welcome. It's an honor yeah. to, uh, to interview you, and uh, something I wanted to do for a long time. After I saw your first, after I saw uh, the documentary Faces, oh, yeah, on the well, project Face yeah. to Face, yeah. I was like, fascinated. So I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to meet you and to, to ask you questions. And, um, this is about one hour we're going to do together, and then the last 10 minutes, there's an opportunity for people here in the audience to ask questions, and also there are a lot of people watching the live stream, and they can also ask questions. But I can ask the first one. Please. <laughs> um, is it true that you don't take off your hat, that you don't take off your glasses, that, no, that we don't get to know your real name? <laughs> <laughs> most of it is true, and most of it is untrue. Actually, all the people you see that I've met in all those places, uh, have seen me without hat and glasses. Ah. It's only when there's a camera that uh -huh. I keep them on. Uh -huh. um, but it had allowed me to be able to travel anonymously when I actually don't have hat and glasses. It's the disguise reversed. So when I did projects at the borders or in complicated situations... Like illegal, illegal, illegal stuff. Illegal stuff, then I just remove hat and glasses and then I, you know, nobody recognized me. Uh -huh. So that's the reason. That's the reason, yeah. Uh -huh. 100%. I actually, when I started, I, I started with graffiti and I would hide myself completely when there was a, whenever there was a camera. So I would basically put like a, you know, like a whole thing on my head. A hoodie and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and even like a, like a nomad in the desert, you know. And so the problem is I remember during my first interview, the people couldn't hear me because I was like, <laughs> talking like that. And so <laughs> at some point, the guy said, no, no, we're not going to be able to do that. Actually, fun fact, my first, the reason why I'm wearing hat and glasses is also partly because of the Netherlands. Oh. Because oh. there was this show, I remember, on VPRO. That I work for the VPRO. That's okay. the broadcaster they I work came, for. They came what did to we do? me <laughs> in France, and I was living in that tiny apartment with, like, social help and stuff. Uh, like to pay the rent, and they came there, they filmed me in the thing, and, we, and then they, and I was completely covered, and they said, no, no, we're not going to be able to do that, we need to put you a mic. Yeah. I was like, I don't know how to do it, I mean, I control my face. And I said, okay, give me five minutes, and I went to the supermarket, and I took the cheapest glasses, and I put tapes on the side, and then <laughs> I, I took a hat, and I came back, and I said, does that work? And I said, yeah, sure, is that fine with you? I was like, I guess, and that's how I started wearing hat and glasses. Ah, wow. Well, good to know that. I'll yeah, tell my I boss. Just, I tell I, my yeah, boss. Yeah, just clear, reality. You can find those archives. They're pretty funny of me, like, in the subway and, like, pasting and making the glue at home. And, and JR? Where did you, where, what uh, is JR has just, like, been forever, like, my initials, and so as graffiti, you need to find ways to not, you know, you're not going to write. I've never seen any writer 
put his real name on a wall. I mean, you know, I don't think so. No. Uh, so that's, you know, just... That's, that's that where it mine. came from. Yeah. And we're sitting in the middle of uh, your exhibition. Um, what, what do we see behind you? Because this so is... Right behind me is one of the murals from Chronicles, which is a series of murals that depict a community, a neighborhood, uh, uh, you know, like a, a situation, like this is around Guns Chronicles. This mm -hmm. one is about New York City. There's another one about... Uh, Clichy Montfermeil, where I started. Yeah. So each of those murals depict hundreds of people, sometimes thousands, within one mural, but when no one is more important than another, everyone is in a, under the same light. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it's a mirror of society throughout that community, throughout that city. And everyone is there, and every single story of this person is recorded. So you point your phone, and it's a free app that we made called JR Murals. You scan any single person. And every, you, every person every, in even this Even some of the work. dogs we recorded. So trust me, we really went for it. <laughs> but, but how do you come up with an idea like this? Like um, this? You know what? Uh, there was a period a couple of years ago where we were stuck in Paris for a little, ba a little bit. And I, 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 I looked at in some of the books of uh, Diego Rivera. Mm -hmm. I would go the, to the, the famous Louvre. painter from uh, Mexico. Exactly. Who depicts community... So a painting, and in there you see like the drunk man, the thief, everybody's just represented, and it's just from another era, from another time. Yeah. And I brought it back to the neighborhoods in Clichy Montfermeil, and I showed it to some friends, and I say, who are you in this? And right away, even without anybody like, asking, where is that, mm -hmm. who are those people? They say, oh, I'm this guy, oh, I'm that person, oh, I'm that guy. They could right away... Identify themselves. Identify. Yeah. So I was like, oh, what could a mural like that look in our day and age? Because I would love to know when I go see a crazy painting at the Louvre, who's on the horse attacking whatever, and like, what was he thinking at the time? Yeah. So that's how I started those murals. And uh, like photographing people, asking them how they want to be represented. Okay, and so everybody could choose Oh yeah, they, everybody choose. Yeah, some didn't have ideas, so I let them look at my sketch. Because I always do those live. So imagine yeah. you come in and you say, well, you know, I'm a journalist. I, I do many other stuff. But in the mural, yeah. I would love to be interviewing someone. Mm. The thing is, when you come, you're by yourself because I photograph person per person. So I say, well, I'll photograph you exactly like that. Mm -hmm. But then I'll find someone you'll interview. And just you might not meet that person, but in the mural, you'll be with that person. Then one day, I'll maybe like, have someone who don't know what... Uh, or how they want to be represented, or I have someone very interesting, and I say, do you want to be interviewed by this amazing journalist? And they will be like, oh, where is that? And I'll be like, look, I just installed her right here. You have to then sit accordingly so that you yeah. connect in the image. And that's how all the mural was made. It's like suddenly it's like, oh, is there still some space on that stoop? Uh, can I be on the bike here? Can I be walking yeah. with those people? And then I would complete it like a puzzle. But how, how does it... Uh, so you make every person is photographed... By one by one. Yeah, one by like one. Like not on the streets. This yes. Is, so where do you do it? What so is your method? That's the best part. If you take this one, like New York City, there's five boroughs in New York City. You know, yeah. Brooklyn, Queens, and that. We would park our, our um, like a giant trucks that have the whole studio inside in different neighborhoods. Nobody knows we're coming. We're just installing it, and then we literally open the curtain and look at what's happening in the street. So a guy selling stuff on the street, someone else going to work, very mm -hmm. busy, another person walking the dog. And we're just like wondering, oh, I wonder who's that person. You know, the kind of thing you sit at a coffee and you look at people and you're like, I wish I knew who is that person. Mm. But you can't just go and, I mean, you can, you but can. people yeah, yeah. don't do it. Or if not, you have to do the whole, hello, my name is. I'm and just like, a you know, curious person. <laughs> exactly. And the people say, well, well, who are you? And yeah. there's all this that needs to happen. This is an amazing tool to just go and tap on someone's shoulder and say, hey, we have this art project, you want yeah. to be part of it, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> and literally, it's like, we jump so much. So first, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait. Social barriers. So yeah. they come yeah. in the truck, they look, and they're like, oh, okay, I see. And we say, you see, you need to be represented how you want. They say, what does that mean? It means that you could have tons of different hats, but which one you want to be in the mural? Mm. And in San Francisco, for example, someone say, well... You see me like this, but I'm a drag queen. Mm. And I said, okay, but the, the question is, do you want to be represented as a drag queen in there or just as regular clothes? And that's how we actually enter in the whole drag queen community. And they would come like 20 or 30 of them. And had, so it, it suddenly opened into people's world. Yeah. And it's amazing. And sometimes people's world is right in front of you. There was a guy walking with a duck. 
you know, yeah, on the street. Yeah, because there's quite a few dogs yeah, here in the like front. Yeah, there's like crazy stories in each of them. Musicians. Some people by the beach and, you know, and so each of those person we actually met and then we said, look, when you go out of the photo truck, we're going to put a mic in front of you. Yeah. You can record whatever you want in there and it'd be forever embedded to the mural. It's not an interview. It's just this piece of audio that you decide mm. what you want to say. In. So if you want your grandchildren one day to click on this and say, that was my grandfather and they want to hear, then tell your whole life story. If not, just say whatever, the, yeah. you, whatever you want. So some people just say, hey, I'm so happy to be there today. Thank you for this amazing experience. And then some other like go and say, well, I was born in 1942 and my parents immigrated from, <laughs> and then they go for the whole story. It's like 35 minutes. So, but literally, but there's so much work. Like, so everybody we see here, you can yeah, use exactly. the app. Actually, you... except that mural, which was my first one, and I regretted it. And, oh, uh, Because why? I didn't, already I had no idea how I would come up with this. So I didn't know if it would work. So I didn't add the audio file on this one. So that's my biggest regret on the first one. And what is the idea with, with, um, so here, with this one? It looks a bit like a revolution. It reminds yeah. me of uh, La Révolution. Uh, yeah, but because, you know, in this neighborhood, we had the largest riots since the French Revolution. Yeah. That was 2005. It exploded after the death of Ziad and Buna. And this is just a couple of kilometers away from Paris, like 30 kilometers. And that's why I did my first pasting. Yeah. And so that's 15 years later. I've done many walks that you can see in the museum in that same neighborhood. But then I came back and I said, how can I portrait everyone? Mm. from the people that I, like the mayor that sued me when I was 18 years old, is still the mayor today. He's in this He's in, in this the world. mural. And oh. in front of him are a lot of people that are angry at him. You have to understand that this was my first mural, so I interview everybody, the drug dealers. I say, well, if, you know, the people who were like pointed for terrorism by France, like everybody, I said, I'm not choosing whoever wants to be in the mural. And if you want to hide yourself, hide yourself. The truth is, we... We, everybody lives here, everybody in the same, it's a mirror of who we are. So I'm not here to say, here are the good people and I didn't take the bad people. You deserve a voice or you don't. But, so what I, is the motivation for you for The motivation for is that those murals depicts also the paradox of our society. And so the fact that in a community like this, you have good and bad. And actually in each one of us, you mm -hmm. have good and bad. Mm -hmm. So who am I to choose the good and the bad? So I ask everybody and the ones who say, no, I don't want to be in, then I respect it, but I had to ask. So a lot of people say, no, I can't be in this, or I can't be, but from my back, or the police people say, no, we, we can't be in this. But then after that, they tell me they regret it, they, would, they wanted to have been in there. There's actually one guy who actually robbed more banks than you know, uh, anyone in the country in France who's in there. I understand why you regret not having all these uh, yeah, individual stories. And you have the people who created the right at the time, but you have all the people who did amazing in the community, some champion of box, some people who like doing amazing things for the kids, some people who like have changed the face of the neighborhood, some people who are reconstructing the whole, because after the riots, you see, they destroy the buildings mm -hmm. and they rebuild the new architecture. So how architecture actually played a role into how this neighborhood became one of the most violent in France. Mm -hmm. So since the architecture have changed, it actually calmed down. It's a whole different place. And the but most amazing thing you have to understand is yeah. when this one was finished, we went and knocked at the door of a museum in Paris called Palais de Tokyo. It's very famous, very so, and we, well known. Yeah. And we told them, can we show the mural next month? And they said, look, 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 we're happy to show the mural, but we need two years to plan it. Yeah. I said, no, 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 we want to show it like right now. And the guy said, look, I love you, but I, 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 it's just, I, that's not how a museum works. I was like, but don't you have like, Balls? at least a, <laughs> no, like a, a moment. He said, look, actually in our biggest exhibition space, we have a gap. That's 10 days between two exhibitions. Do you want that? But it's, I could give you six months exhibition. I was like, no, I'll take the 10 days. We built uh, like this at the giant size. It mm -hmm. was like 40 meter long and like six meter high, everybody life size. We, we said opening day on that day. We sent buses to the neighborhood to bring everybody here. Oh, wow. We announced it. And then the French president at the time was Holland, heard about this. And he said, can I come and visit the show at the museum? So my team told me that. I was like, great, of course, sure. So he came and his security team said, the president will come at 3 p.m. 
And I said, well, I mean, the, the opening is tonight at 6, but I mean, no, there was, he had to be in wherever, in Bordeaux tonight, mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. So at 3 p.m., the president comes in, walks in, stay in front of the mural and say, wow, this is the history of France. Yeah. And he says, w when, when is the opening? I said, well, we told it to you, security services, that it's tonight. He said, I need to be there for that. It's too important. He canceled his whole day. And then we had three hours with the president like literally killing time in the museum, you know, like walking <laughs> around. I'll never forget, there was this artist, I forgot his name. He was, it was really funny. He's a famous artist, I just forgot his name. He's, he was sitting in a glass box on eggs. Oh, no. So that the, like for weeks, so that he would actually... Performance artist. A performance yeah. artist, so the yeah. eggs would actually become, you know, like, so he would uh -huh. keep the same temperature, and he was sitting, and I was there with the president looking at this guy sitting on eggs. <laughs> <laughs> then we walked around. We had to kill time. Surreal, surreal. But 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 the motivation for you, because so so but this is one of the first murals you did. Yeah. And and I think it's quite special that you get buses to these air, to these neighborhoods and people go to Palais de Tokyo, yeah. which is like the uh, elite. You know, museums have also in the yeah. Netherlands, I think, all over the world. It's for a certain class, and yeah, they yeah. Find every museum wants to have the whole country, the, everybody in their um, in their museum, which is really difficult, yeah. but you managed to do this. Well, so what happened is at 6 p.m. we called to know if the buses were here. Mm -hmm. And actually they were late, so everybody arrived <laughs> at 7 p.m. <laughs> when people arrived, they had never seen a mural. So the first thing they did is look at themselves. Yeah. They didn't even see the president. And the president was like, <laughs> well, hey, hello. I'm, and the French president was like, oh my God, that's me there. Yeah. So even the mayor that's in there that sued me when I was 18 came in. So suddenly, what was actually clever, the president said, well, well who is who in there? And so the people said, well, uh, let's start from the beginning. And so who is in that section? And people <laughs> said, well, that's me. I'm very proud because of this. And another one, well, that's me. I lost my brother in the riots. That's why it happened. So very like everybody was just talking and trying to explain him what had happened because no president could have, you know, come in that neighborhood. And since years, they can't do a visit there. It's very complicated. It's always tension. Uh, tension. Yeah. So then we get to the mayor. And so, everybody, so the mayor said, well, you know, I, happy to be in this walk, even if we had some different with JR. And I said, yeah, he's, he sued me, you know? <laughs> and so the, mayor was, the president was like, oh my God, you sued him? Well, you know, I, they didn't ask any permission. They pasted on the buildings. And everybody was like, ooh, and stuff. So, <laughs> like, Whoa. so then the president said, he, he said to the mayor, he said, look, if you give them a wall that stay permanent, I will come and inaugurate it. But it have to be in the next two months because then I'm not the president anymore. <laughs> So then the mayor was like, he never had the president come. So he was like, oh, yeah, of course, so we'll find a wall. So then he comes to me and says, okay, okay, we have to sort this out. Okay, wh wh where do you want it? And I say, I want it in the neighborhood. I want it public to everybody. Yeah. We find a wall, we install it, and we put a giant sheet over it. And so the president comes, security everywhere, people on rooftops, snipers. He arrives and then comes out and we unveil the piece and yeah. then there was a little podium and we go up there with me, my friend Laj Lee, that you see the first photo you saw in the entrance mm -hmm. of the guy holding his yeah. camera, the mayor and the president. And so there's a crowd there and the, um, the president do a speech and say, I declare this a uh, monument of friends and now basically by saying this, he's basically saying we recognize people that come from second generation immigrants being part of the history of friends. Which yeah. is very clever for him just to say that, just a word. It doesn't cost anything. It's clever, but it's also important, right? It's important, but yeah. then that's why people don't feel represented in museums. They just go to the Louvre or those places and they don't see themselves. No, they don't recognize themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. then the mayor went and talked and everybody booed him. We, he couldn't talk. Ooh. So it was very embarrassing. So we, <laughs> we went back on the mic and we said, okay, guys, let's do time out one second. Mm -hmm. We know we don't like him. Like, literally, we spoke openly like that. We know we don't like him. He did nothing for this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Now we're here. Let's just hear what he have to say. Yeah. Let's just, uh, we're here, like we did this thing. It's yeah. going to be there. He's in it. And so he basically apologized in front of everybody. He said, I know I haven't done anything for this neighborhood. Yeah. I, I, you know, uh, I, I apologize for it. And I intend to, in the future, try to connect do, more. And do a do better more. job. But is this for you the, the, the motivation that there's a dialogue, that people are seeing? I'll be honest. I didn't expect that. And the reaction to that was, it was no clapping or woo. It was just like, after yeah. that, just boom, 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 end of story. But then everybody hanged by the mural. And I saw him discuss with some elder people, all like, like, you know, all the guys who used to run the neighborhood like 10 years before. And what I saw is that there was a beginning of a conversation yeah. 
between people that should have never talked. Yeah. And that was a big lesson to me because that's where I started. So I thought that this was just an enemy for life. And I had never thought that we could actually solve it and that this piece would have anything to do with it. But on the small neighborhood like that, because at the end it's just a small neighborhood, oh. you have that connection that happened, how people felt represented, mm -hmm. felt they existed, and then the mayor recognizing them. And actually since then, still people would say he's extreme right. We don't like him, mm -hmm. but he had to consider us and now he had to basically include us around the table mm -hmm. and he cannot do one decision without including us. So yeah. it, it, they know they don't share the same point of view, but actually they're discussing. Yeah, they're, and that, that's, that's, was that's a big a lesson. Yeah. You know? And if we, if we look at your work like more on a general level, because it's, it's always about communities, it's about people, it's, it's in the public uh, sphere, in the public spaces. Um, what, what role do the communities have in your, in your artwork? Well, you know, the community is essential because in most of the places I go to, I don't have the permit. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I go and I say, everybody move out, I have this paper, I need to paste. I have zero paper. Mm -hmm. I have just my paper actually and glue, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't have an authorization. So basically I ask every single person, are you okay for me to paste there? And then they ask, why is that for? Is that political? What's mm -hmm. the message? And then uh, so yeah, sure, I'm for it. And then another one, and then another one. It's a lot of conversation. So at the end, I feel like I have a permit because it's like a mini referendum. Yeah. And if everybody say, yeah, for me, that's enough. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I'm not doing anything illegally because I'm doing it with the community. Yeah. But if, you, for example, this project, this is uh, Kikito, yeah. a young boy from Mexico. And this is the, the border between Mexico and the US. Yeah. How do you come up with this? Well, you know, you have to understand my mind is, is, is very simple. I see walls, I paste on it. No, but the I problem don't believe is, that. <laughs> this is not a wall. This is a see-through wall. You see, yeah. I cannot paste on it. Yeah. So for years, people keep telling me, you got to go do something at the you know, border of Mexico and US. Mm -hmm. There's a wall. And I would look at photos and I was like, ah, actually, it's, it's a wall. It's a fence, but it's not a wall that I can paste on. And then one day when I was working in Brazil, I, I realized I can build giant scaffolding. And that's when I started doing those sculpture, basically, and do the cutout of the images. Yeah. I was like, all right, now I can do the wall there. So I went and I scouted and I realized that... No, but, but I want to understand what goes... Because you say it's yeah. simple, but I don't believe that. So what is, wh where does the fascination start? If you, when do you think, okay, there's a border between the US and Mexico and I want to do something there? When, what, what's the Well, click? the first one was in Israel-Palestine. Yeah. But you have to understand, when you do this, the, the work I do, everybody comes to you with the world's biggest problem every day. Yeah. They say, oh, <laughs> you know, in this country they're building this. Oh, have you heard that? Everybody. Yeah. So that's why I started this project called Inside Out. And I said, well, if you're from there, you should do it. Yeah. Because sometimes who better than the locals to do it in their yeah. own community? Um, but to this project, because it's so illegal, I, you can't tell the people, go and get arrested. So if I do it, I only take my own risk to do it. And my mm. team, or who, who wants to actually come and do it? Because we could lose our visas, our passport, our, you know, and mm -hmm. get arrested. Um, but we didn't know if it was possible. So I think it's more, first, a curiosity. I want to go and see by myself with my own eye, mm -hmm. which I always, each time I do an installation, and this one mainly, I do it in a place that people can go and drive to see it with their own eyes so that they can make their own opinion of the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very important. So mm -hmm. that's what actually defined why I went there mm. and did it at this exact location. I could have done it in many other locations. I wanted it there because there's a road on each side that you can just drive mm -hmm. and safely park and go and watch it. Uh -huh. So, but this is, okay, so you want to see it for yourself. And this project, uh, uh, and the first wall uh, is between Israel and, and Palestine. It's called Face to Face, right? Yeah. Yeah, I th I'm going to show a picture for the people uh, yeah. at home. So this is the project. Um, how does how this, this project came about? Well, at that time, they were building the wall, actually, in yeah. 2006. So a friend of mine told me, you know, they're building this wall, you should go see. And at that time, I, I, all I knew was the projects outside Paris. I'd never really traveled. And everybody, and I'm sure it was the same here, but people mm. had an opinion about yeah. Israel and Palestine. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized when I did this project in the projects in France, that people had even, you know, they, they would only look at situations through the media. And yeah. I wanted to go and sit with my own eyes. So yeah. I just took a ticket to go there. And I realized that with my French passport, I could go either side very easily. Mm -hmm. Because... Could you? Yeah. 
as French. But uh, aren't you, uh, if, you, if it's too personal, just let me know. I remember when I went to Israel yeah. and my dad's from Morocco, yeah. I had a really a hard time getting in the country. Oh, you yeah, know, for sure. You I was get a kept hard there time. for hours. I had yeah. to undress. Uh, no, no, like, but I look, I have ridiculous. police records in every yeah. country. So, so I, it's not that easy. Let's skip that. I have problem yeah. getting everywhere. <laughs> you yeah. know, they look at my where I've been arrested. They question me for hours. I don't even include that anymore. And it's just part of it. Yeah. As, then I'm there and I'm there. Then I have my French passport and I can go anywhere. And then I realize the luck I have because a Palestinian couldn't do that, but an Israeli also couldn't go on the other mm -hmm. side. So they, they stuck to, be, to look at each other through the eyes of what they hear through the media, which is often the worst of what's happening on the other side. Yeah, yeah. So I went there and I, I realized, okay, you know, I was very scared. People texted me and said, good luck. We hope you come back alive yeah. and stuff. I was like, where am I going? Oh, my God, you know. I keep receiving yeah. those texts. And it was before social media or anything. I just had told friends that I was going there. And I remember passing the wall, going to Palestine, going into a taxi, and like realizing, okay, when is this gonna, like, when is the war gonna start? Or when, yeah. where, what is gonna happen to me? Because yeah. that was the fear that I had. And yeah. of course, a lot of it is real, but yeah. it's just not everywhere at every not, inch Not of the... 24 hours. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, I'm afraid to talk to him, like, should I tell him? Should I not tell him what I'm about to do? And then after five minutes, I realized that actually, you know, he's just a cab driver, he has children, he's just living his normal life, he's doing his job, and he asked me where I want to go. And then I asked him, I said, well, I have this idea, but I don't know if it makes sense to you, but tell me, sir, I just before I leave you, I want to do this project where I photograph you as a taxi driver, mm -hmm. and then another taxi driver that I would meet on the other side. Yeah. And he said, well, yeah, okay, but what, what do you want to do that? I said, because then I, I will have two taxi drivers, and... Uh, and I would place them next to each other. And he said, okay, and what, what do you do that? And I said, well, it's so that I think that if I place them big enough and stuff, people won't recognize who is who. Mm -hmm. Who is and, Israeli and who is, and who is Palestinian. Palestinian. Yeah. And so he said, well, look, you can take my photo and I'll sign your paper if you want, but you got to do what you're saying. You got to come back and paste it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think you'll have trouble pasting it, you know, <laughs> maybe on the other side. But I think here people will be open to it. And so then I would go to a hairdresser and, and like look through the, you know, the window. I look really like a weirdo, you know. I look at people and say, hey, he looks like a great guy. I'd come in and say, hello, sir. And the guy's cutting hair. What, what do you want? And I was like, look, I, you know, I'm doing this project. And, and, say, and the guy said, well, wait, but what are you going to do with it? I'm going to paste it big. Like, big like how? They are big like, like your whole like door and, you know, like the whole facade. He's like, really? He's like, oh, I'll sign your paper, but you better do this because, yeah. you know. And then I would go on the other side, and I would do the same, and people would tell me the exact same thing. Yeah. So, the peop so one hairdresser on, the, on one side and a hairdresser well, on the exactly. other side. So yeah. 20 different jobs, uh, you know, uh, farmers, teachers, like, you know, security guards, everybody. I went back home, and then I was like, okay, I need some money to go back and actually paste it. Ah, so that's how it came about. But yeah. the thing is, I was like, if I ask any sponsors then the project might look, first of all, they might not be interested at all in helping, but also if you take Coca-Cola, for example, yeah. then you, you know, it, you may be more sided towards Israel yeah. than if you take Mecca Cola, yeah. and then you may be more sided. Like anything have a political yeah. meaning, yeah. and so depending on where the money comes from, you're basically choosing. choosing or, yeah. or it, so how did you fund it? So basically, you know, I, at that time, how did I fund it actually? It's a good question. <laughs> Because it costs so little, but when, okay, when we did the project in uh, Montfermeil, we sold, I would do jobs on the side, and we sold like clothes that we found, and, and then with that money, we paid for the posters. When we did Israel Palestine, I think I had started selling a couple, like little prints like that for a couple hundred bucks from people to people, and, uh, and so it could pay the, the tickets and the printing. Mm. Every friend that come on the trip paid for their own travel. Mm. And then um, we rented a van, and that was the biggest cost. And then we would sleep in like cheap hotels and all. Yeah. But is, there, is that something important for you still? Because uh, oh, this yeah. project is, was quite a few years ago that you're independent, that you don't get any funding from companies or... or... From that time it stayed, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's but, a very important point. How so where, where do you get your money then to do everything? So it's a very important question to me. It's almost as a project in itself. Yeah. Because at that time I could solve that because it was not much. And friends would travel and... But doing this but is then like doing this, really so expensive. Over the years... 
I've sailed outwards and mm -hmm. I always reinvested everything into the projects. Mm. People don't necessarily know that and it doesn't matter because it's not ha like having uh, donors that say, I'm giving you this, but I'm expecting that. It's like yeah. I'm selling a piece of art. The person who owned that piece can resell it. Yeah. And it's theirs. But you have autonomy over But what then you I make. have the money and it's autonomy. Yeah. And so just logically over the years, I've just always reinvested. And so we kept total freedom. When you taste that, it's very hard to do any other way. Yeah. Because of course I'm contacted by like bottles of uh, sparkling water or like whatever, like you named yeah. it, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> closing companies or But yeah, I think whatever. you have like a million people following you on Instagram also. Yeah, but it's, 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 you know, it's, it's often the companies that want to use the image yeah. of this. But yeah. the people who participate there, they don't do it to like advertise yeah. for, you know, like yeah. Chanel or yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, someone, something that have nothing to do with their message. So it's very interesting because over the years, the way that brand or corporate approach have changed. It used to be, we, you know, you paste this person on the wall, but he have a, a mm -hmm. Levi's jean and we mm -hmm. give you a million dollar. Mm -hmm. it, then it becomes, you don't paste that it's uh, a jean from whoever or that it's, uh, you know, but it's our foundation that's mm -hmm. called the foundation, yeah. whatever, L'Oreal yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever, yeah, yeah. will actually um, uh, pay for it and then we'll say in the press that we paid for it. And so the way that brands approach it uh, have changed. And so I've always like listened, but I've, I, I, I have, a, I, I, we, we just read the emails, but we don't do the meetings. And each time a brand would actually come and, uh, and use it without, or like copy the model. Uh, there was this brand years ago, like 15 years ago that copied the whole thing. It was in magazines and they like did a big thing about their client being their heroes. And we sued them. And ah. then, you know, they were like, whoa, wait, wait, but what have you invented? Have you invented black and white? Have you invented photography? And it was very tricky. Did but you then, win? Sorry? Did no, you but win? you know what we did? They were really like, like nasty to us, like ah. nasty lawyers calling, saying, we're going to destroy you. Who do you think you are? And then I looked in my mailbox. They had wrote me. And they <laughs> said, can you do the campaign? And so the next day they apologized, removed the campaign worldwide and paid. So literally, yeah. artists don't know that, that they have their right to their work. And of course, usually a company will go very hard at them and say, mm -hmm. we're going to destroy you. You don't own anything. You haven't invented anything. Uh, but, they, you know, you can defend your rights. And that's something that I've been doing all over those years. But most of the time, it's just, uh, uh, it's been creating a, a safe environment for me to create within. Yeah. And within what I have, not what I could have. So every project I do, depending on what I have. Yeah. So not of like, oh, if I had 10 million, then I could do this amazing thing. Well, I don't have them, so let's skip yeah. that part and do with what, what, what I have. And um, um, you, you started in the graffiti scene, right? In, yeah. uh, in France, um, being like an anonymous, you, st you still are anonymous. But graf graffiti has this rebellion, uh, you know, air to it. It's illegal, sometimes not always. Sometimes you even get a wall from a community or a government. But is this something you, um, you can still s see in your work, this, this background of graffiti? Yeah, well, when you look at the piece you were just referring in Mexico, yeah. it's exactly done in the same... Uh, look, I'm not trying to do everything I can illegally. That's not the idea. The idea is to do things, but when I don't have a choice, I do them illegally. Yeah. When you go work in, in Turkey or in different places in the world where I've been to work, or in Somalia, and stuff, you can't have any permit, so I yeah. just go and do it. But when I can have it, then I do it with the authorization. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, at the end, what I'm trying to do is gather a community together. My message is there. It's how to bring people to pace together and do things together or like get to know each other. That's your message. That's my message. My yes. message is not to say, hey, look at this. I managed to do it with no permission. Mm -hmm. Often I don't have a choice because if I had asked the U.S. government to install something at the border, then it means that I would have taken side. Yeah. Or if I asked the Mexican yeah. government, then yeah. it's... So the neutral way to do it was just to go and do it illegally. Yeah. And the same at the border of Mexico. There's a few of the projects like that that it's because I have no other choice. Yeah. Okay, so that's, then you, st you do it illegally. And, and um, now we're in a museum, but your work is very often like in the public, yeah. in the streets, yeah. uh, outside. Um, um, yeah, how, how, do, how do these two connect? What is, a what is the role for a museum in, uh, regarding your work? So the role is very important. And because I'm people have to buy a ticket to get, to get yeah. in. The role is very important because from the beginning I understood that part that the work is ephemeral. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's pasted and mm -hmm. it gets destroyed. Sometimes yeah. it stays only a couple of days. Sometimes it stays a couple of months. Yeah. And then it's gone. 
And yeah. often the documentation of it is the trace that helps you understand how the people responded to it, or perceived it, or how it changed the perception. So it's about the documentation. So documentation can yeah. happen in many ways, books, mm -hmm. films, that's what I always did. Mm -hmm. But like museum show is very important because you actually can get a scope at those different traits of how people responded, mm -hmm. the artworks, which are, you have to understand that the originals, the pieces that you see in the show, is the only trace physical of the actual piece. The rest is just photos on internet. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a way to actually see the original artworks, which is very important. I start every project knowing that there'll be a very limited number of pieces that will be the original trace, that's the only one that I sign. Yeah. And then the rest is just anybody can take photos. There's no copyright. You can take a photo. It's out there in the street and public. Yeah. So and but it, it, that's true because if you walk through the exhibition, you see like videos of your work, pictures of your exactly. pictures. Um, what is social media? What for? Because that's quite important. Yeah. I imagine. What does it mean to you? So social media. You know, even before social media, in 2001, I had my first website, yeah. which is still the same one, <laughs> and then. I would put on it a couple of years after something say get involved. It was a map of the world, and you could say, "Hey, I'm here in Groningen, and I, you know, I'm 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 here, and I'm I have a wall, or I can I'm happy to paste." Or you can say what your there was a few options, and then I could have a map of oh, there's like 40 people in this city that are interested in your project. Maybe I should go check. Or there's like uh, 200 people in Pakistan, or there's and that's how I would actually navigate and email only those people and say, mm -hmm. "Hey, I'm coming to this town." I heard you had a wall, can I come see it? Then social media came, and so uh, especially Instagram have helped me to actually always have someone when I'm pasting who say, hey, I'm seeing you through my window, and I would respond, say, oh, can I come and take a photo from your window? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I found and I communicate with many people in the city in an amazing way that, you know, I, I'm still using it incredibly. Even if we were just talking about that earlier with some friends, the fact that the algorithm of Facebook and Instagram is literally deciding who's going to see your image and yeah. how many of the whatever followers you have are going to see it is actually very scary today because it, yeah. it doesn't mean that because you have millions of followers that when you post, they're going to see it. So this is really something that I'm thinking a lot because it doesn't matter if you speak to a million. What's important is you speak to your audience, to yeah. your community. So who, who owns your work? Who owns your art? My art is public and it's owned by the people. But the originals of it, the actual mm -hmm. piece is owned by collectors who, like museums also, mm -hmm. who collect those pieces the same way you have an amazing here collections of, you know, paintings from the 80s, from phase two and, you know. I even saw your first uh, camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's why those pieces are still there, even if some of those artists passed away, because the museum is keeping it, because a collector mm -hmm. is holding They're preserving it, it. so that yeah. I can today see it. And that's why I know that you know, the people who collect my work are doing this, this work, and some of them that are in the show are actually owned by collectors that are lended mm. to the exhibition and they're gonna get back. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to me that part of it is essential because this is how all the work that you're seeing is actually happening. Yeah. To me, that's like the, 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 the core, the purest model that I could find without having to say, you know, okay, whatever, I don't know, let's think yeah. of a brand. Uh, if Nike, Ni yeah. you know, that was the first one on my on my mind. <laughs> Nike <laughs> said, "Well, a good job. Yeah. why don't we do some T-shirts and some stuff?" Even if you know, I don't mind. It's not the question if I like or not the brand. That's not the question. I'm not anti-brand. Mm -hmm. But I say, well, we would represent this mural and like you know, and maybe we say that we like support this and we make some T-shirts and all the money goes back there. Suddenly, it it I'm there sitting at and doing meetings that I you know, about how is the brand gonna f like empower itself yeah. where all my work is about the community. So instead of like losing and wasting time talking with marketing directors who are gonna and try to lead me towards into how they can empower their brands with this, yeah. I wanna stay in the field that I'm doing, that's all. Yeah, that's so you all don't I do this. Do. So you exactly, don't. I just don't do it. But let's talk about another project. Yeah. Uh, I think we have about 15, 20 minutes left. Um, you have uh, a non-profit organization called Can Art Change the World? And one of these projects is the... Courtrage Mai, one of the schools, yeah. Courtrage Mai is one of the schools in France. What, what is your um, idea behind this, this, or, this so, organization? Since the beginning, we, uh, we always find a way to how to give back within the community where mm -hmm. we have started. So 
Uh, really early, I've started the first school in Brazil when I was 24, and now it's been you know, 12 years that it's open. And um, then uh, only a couple of years ago, uh, I, I, I started a school of art with young artists, not to tell them how to do art, but to tell them how to survive as an artist. Mm. I did it for two years, and then I continued following the students. So this was in <coughs> Brazil? No, this one was in France. Ah, okay. And, uh, but we've done it in lots of different shapes. Um, and we also done in the, one of the projects you're showing here, Women Are Heroes in Kenya, mm -hmm. where we would go every year and cover more of the roof to protect the roof from the rain for mm -hmm. the people because their roof was leaking. But each time there was, we focused all our energy into helping within the places where we started, like in this community and in the projects out of Paris, like in Brazil, like in Kenya, like not everywhere, but where it would make sense, we would do it. And that's what this organization is about. But the, the name is, Can Art uh, yeah. Change the World? So can it? Look, <laughs> I actually had a who, good... Who uh, thinks art can change the world here? I <laughs> ah, so little hands. Oh. oh, okay, a bit more. Yeah. You know what's interesting is a lot of those projects, uh, I've seen the impact and the change yeah. in sometime over a decade, over 20 years. And we really saw the impact of it. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a, a stat that you can come with numbers. What it does is it changes the perception you have about a place. By mm -hmm. changing the perception you have about a place, you're actually changing the world because it, it makes people think differently about a location, yeah. maybe make them think about going there. But I know people love numbers, you know, and I love no. people say, well, well, I have proved me within numbers. Recently, I've done a project in a maximum security prison in California. Yeah. Because this is a world that is totally closed, that is behind walls, yeah. where the people are actually locked up there for 30 years, and, um, and that it's one of the, the, the top three most violent prisons in the States. I had this permit from the governor of California that I had never met. I've, he was in one of my mural before he was a governor. I'm trying to find so the So then picture. he was one of the person in the mural and then ended up becoming the governor. And then he heard that I was trying to do a project in a prison in California. Yeah. And he said, well, I remember that guy. He photographed me before I was a governor. Give him full clearance. So I walked in this prison, and I walked with a group of 15 mates, and then we paced up the whole yard of the prison with all the faces, and including some of the victims and including the guards. The victims also. Yeah. And you can sit on the app also, and you can listen to every single story. What happened in a couple of weeks because of that project was like the numbers are insane. We had 50 people in, uh, from the prison, after two months, all of them have been moved to a lower security, and one third of them have been freed within the year. What had happened there is that you realize within that system, they get lost in the system. Mm -hmm. And some of them are there after like decades, and the states almost forget that they're still holding them. And so when the case got restudied, because they were in this project, and their story was out, and they could listen to this thing, <laughs> it was this very deep thing where you're like, whoa, it means that you go in many prisons, and there's a lot of people that shouldn't be there, but if suddenly there was a different light of them, they could be out. And there's some that should never go out, and they're still there, that's not a question. But there was this debate that was open, and the mm -hmm. debate was like, can a man change? And so it's all stories by stories, but mm -hmm. trust me, in this maximum security, they have actually studied every case, and this was something that was very looked at because it was public yeah. when those faces came out, when we did the project. And the stories of these people came was out. was very public. And is that, is that like the most fulfilling for you, if, if you... If, if it no, it's, to me, it was one of the most interesting projects to see how fast the impact can change. Yeah. Ha happen. And why it happens so fast? Because it's in a closed space, closed yeah. environment, where you can yeah. literally can count everything, and everything is actually counted. Yeah. And when you disrupt that system for a minute, which we did just for a minute, then suddenly people start talking to each other. In a maximum security prison, there's no conversation, there's no, uh, they, everything is made to dehumanize mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, and, and you're doing exactly, exactly the opposite. You're, so you, you're humanizing everybody. Exactly. You're so you do just a little bit of that, and you see the impact. The impact yeah. is just right away huge yeah. on people. You see how it changed their behavior. Then, of course, like, you know, which, a lot of... Which, the, what, is, yeah. what story changed you the most? If you look back now at all your work, what are you... There's so many, but, like, if I take into that One. prison... Yeah. Uh, when I... Photogra when I photographed the inmates, there's one that came to me and he had a swastika on his face. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I've, I've never seen that. I've seen a movie, you know, uh, American, American History X. X. Yeah. And, oh. I, and then suddenly I had the guy in front of me. So 
So I ask him, I say, how can, I'm sorry, I, I got to ask you because it takes me a bit of courage to do, but what, what do you have done on your face? I said, oh, he, almost like he had forgotten about it. He said, oh, this, no, no, and it's, when I was in the gang, but like, I, this is behind me, but I'm just stuck with it because, uh, you know, you do those gang things in prison and then you can't remove them because you can't remove tattoos in prison. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And his face and whatever he was, you know, his energy kind of made me think, wow, he doesn't look like, a, he looks like he has changed, but I might totally be wrong because he still have this on his face. So I, I took a photo of him and he was... I, the craziest part is when I was in prison, I was allowed to have my phone, which have never been ha happened before. And actually, I don't think I'll be ever happen again <laughs> because the governor have given full clearance. Yeah. And then I could just walk without being searched and I could film and share on social media live. So while I was in there, I took a photo of him as one of the stories. And I said, I met this guy. He said that if he could, he would remove it. And then I posted this. 70 to 80 percent of the people say, oh, wow, we can see in his eyes that this guy seems mm -hmm. like a good person. Mm -hmm. But of course, 20, 30 percent say, hey, how can you post this? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't post a swastika. It looks like you're defending. And I, so I went back to him and said, look, Kevin, there's something you should know. There's something called social media. Because he's been there for 17 years. He didn't know what social media is. I said, so the people are responding live. And mm -hmm. I said, a lot of people believe in you. And, you know, maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't. Uh, I don't know. You don't know, yeah. But a lot of people are actually... You know, giving you the really benefit offended. of the doubt. Oh, They're okay. really offended. Mm -hmm. And so I said, let's do this. Why don't you respond to them now? Every single comment you respond, and I'm going to film you. We're going to be next to each other, and I'm going to put the camera, and you're just going to explain you know, why you did this, what motivates you, how you came back from that, in your own words. And what happened? So we did it a couple times, in the same two days. And each time, more people were like, oh, now we understand. Oh, okay, I see. Well, if he wants to remove it, I'll give some money and we can help. And then start to be thousands of people who say, we'll give some money to help remove it. Let's remove this tattoo. And then each time he would explain, he'd say, you have to understand when I came, I was young, I, was, uh, I had to mm. you know, be accepted and I did this and I went into this whole ideology of the white supremacist and now I was stuck in it and then I came back from it. So one day on the following week, we came with a book from Art Spiegelman about the mm -hmm. Shoah, which is called Mouse, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. actually just been forbidden into schools in the mm -hmm. US, uh, which is uh, crazy. We gave him the book, which mm -hmm. is a cartoon you can, he won the Pulitzer Prize, we can read it in mm -hmm. two hours. We said, you should read this, and we actually had it signed for you by the author, by Art Spiegelman himself signed it for you. So he was like, oh wow, thank you. He went, and the cover is like a big swastika on the cover. He read it, the next morning he told us, you know, I called my mom last night, and I told her that I, you guys gave me this book and that, uh, you know, I read about the Holocaust and all this. And she said, but you stupid moron. You go in prison and do this on your face where your grandfather's brothers died in Auschwitz because they were hiding Jews in Poland. Our wow. family is from Poland. Wow. And he, he suddenly started realizing two things. One is that his symbol offended people that you know, for my team, like me and other people, but also people that would sing him through social media. But the craziest part is that in prison, when I would talk to other gangs, mm -hmm. black, Latinos, all the people, I would ask them, they would, I would say, but how can you talk to him? And I said, wait, wait, with him, Kevin? Say, yeah, like, he drinks from my cup, he's my brother. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but like, you guys are supposed to be opposite gang and color. He said, oh, no, man, Kevin is the best guy ever, greatest heart, pure heart, he's a great guy. And you can see those videos, they're online, they yeah. film in the jail in the middle of the gangs, literally them explaining that they see behind the tattoo. Yeah. Now, what's crazy about this story But is he that was also quite naive and stupid. Let's, let's just let's went, be oh, honest. Oh, yeah, he went deep into the gang yeah. um, uh, As if he culture, yeah. and he came back from it within the jail. Yeah. Then, of course, he regretted it deeply, and yeah. he spent the last couple of years in jail to try to convince other people not to go through the same path. But he mm. was stuck with his tattoo. He now came out of prison three months ago. I went and picked him up, and then the first night I took him at the um, Museum of uh, to uh, Tolerance in Los Angeles. Yeah. I had the screening of the movie. Nobody knew he was there, and at the end, there was a big conversation in the room. People went hard at him, like hard, mm -hmm. you know, because they were like, like... I maybe did just now also. Yeah, yeah. no, and you should, yeah. because people are like yeah. truly offended. And I wanted to see how, and I told him, like, you don't have to do this, but the thing he said, no, no, I should do it, and I feel ashamed, and I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, and especially in a place like the Museum of Tolerance. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was really hard. His mother was there, his grandmother was there, 
they, it, it was a lot of crying in the room and exchange. But he kind of like pulled it out of how, he tried to think of how he went through that path and then how he got stuck with the tattoo. But the next day, we went to remove the tattoo. Mm. And the woman who got to do it was a Jewish doctor. By chance, it was coincidence. And it's a few sessions. You don't do it in one day. Mm. So what he do now is he do makeup every day until like it will take six to eight months to remove it. The question here is there's yeah. no black or white. Yeah. It's just like people who make or bad right choices. Or yeah. The question, or right or wrong, mm. is just can you come back from that or can, uh, can I change the world or can a man change? That's mm -hmm. a big question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, can, and, and can you engage? And can you engage or can yeah. you give someone a second chance? During these two years and a half of the project when he was locked up, I asked that question every day and I have to say that each time I posted on social media and saw the reactions, I was kind of like, reassured by people having the same feeling as me, saying, wow, this guy clearly don't look like a guy with a swastika that's mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. to hate other people. Mm -hmm. But he still has the swastika on his face, mm -hmm. and he is offending a lot of us. And I told him, even if in jail he had convinced everybody, even the guards, the guards signed some papers saying, this guy will never see him again. He's been the, the cleanest and yeah. like out of drug, out of this, helping others, thing, out of any fights, thing, out of any gangs. And in a place like that, it's very hard because, you know, it's like one of the yep. worst prisons. Yeah. So now that he's outside and it's only been three months, of course, time will tell only. But it's yeah. a big question because it questions each single one of us. Yeah. Do we forgive? Exactly. Yeah. So he, and you stayed in contact with oh, him. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we're, we're, okay. Questions for the audience. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, please raise your hand and, and stand up if you've got a question. And then there's somebody with a microphone who's coming over. I see two hands. Maybe the guy here at the front with a, with a cap. And then I also have some questions from the people on the live stream. Uh, hello. Yeah, I was uh, wondering, um, what does your team look like? And um, yeah, what do they uh, mean for you? And how did your team sort of uh, evolved, evolved over time? Yeah. So uh, the team is essential because if you look at any of the projects, it's literally projects you look at and say, well, nobody can do that by themselves. So they build so that not only, you know, I can't do it by myself, not only us as a team, we can't do it by ourselves, we have to involve the community. So every project is designed to be done with the most people possible doing it. So the team is essential. Most of them came as volunteers, you know, first, and that's how then they... You know, we hired them and then they become part of the team. Some are there since 10, 15 years. Some are there since like a year or two. But it's always like started this way. So they're essential. They're the core. That's how projects happen. That's how we build projects. And also that's how we decide on projects. Because I don't just go and say, oh, I have this idea. We should do this. If everybody say, well, it's a shitty idea. I don't have to convince them really hard. <laughs> but cool. if they yeah. still say it's a shitty idea, I can't do it. Because, you know, I can't do it by myself. You need so your team. We always like de Democratic. Debate. Yeah, we always we, we debate. We say in the Netherlands, polderen. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it's a, it's the way of our, uh, how we look. We, we keep on talking till everybody agrees. And, and yeah, but sometimes, trust me, <laughs> and sometimes I think about it, and it's like, thank God I didn't do that project. It was a really <laughs> shitty idea. But at the time, I thought it was a good idea. So it's, it's, uh, I know it's like a safer environment, even if sometimes I'm like, oh, I really want to do this, but I have to convince everyone else, you know. Cool. Quick other question. Uh, ah, no, 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 at the beginning, it was because I was doing photocopy and I had zero money, so black and white photocopy is so cheap. Then I found a way to enlarge them, and it was on architect's plans machines, and they're very cheap also because they're meant to print architect's plans, and so those ones are not valuable. They just print, and you're like, oh, okay, we'll change the plan. We throw it away. You do another one. So I started tricking those machines to print black and white, like photographs. Then over the years, I realized, whoa, in the streets, it's only colors, and colors is the code for advertising most of the time. So I'll differentiate myself from advertising because it's the opposite of advertising. And then over the time, it became kind of a signature. Mm -hmm. So any of the work you see in the street, I never sign them. I never like write. At the beginning, I used to do it for the first two, three years. But then at some point, I stopped, and just the pacing of the black and white 
most of the time people see that I don't need them to know it's me. I just want them to see the people that are on the, the mural. So then, of course, over the years it became a signature, but to me it's the best part is that you see it and you're like, okay, who's that kid? And you have no interference of who put it and why. It's just like you're facing that kid overlooking the wall and you have to make your own opinion of it. Then you can look <laughs> online and you'll find very quickly who did it, but the first encounter, it's like with a painting where you're like just looking at the painting and it doesn't say powered by, you know, Pepsi. And do you think it limits you in a way? Did I, sorry? Do you think it limits you in a way? Oh, um, it's definitely a constraint, but I, I kind of love it. You, you know, as artists, you need to always work within constraints. If not, everything's possible, you yes. know, and like, well, where to start? Yeah. So I had some fun sometimes to do a bit of color here and there, but I have, uh, you know, especially for the mural, with color, it could look so amazing. You put everyone in different, like you can play with the colors and this, you could make it so pop. But so far, I actually was like, okay, how do I kind of build this mural just with black and white? Mm. It's gonna make my life way harder. <laughs> but if I make it, it can be, you know, very interesting. So, I, it's, you know, it's trust good, me, I thought about it. It's good to be limited. Yeah, moment. exactly. Are there any other questions from the audience here? I see, uh, no, no, yeah, the lady there on the left, and then I have some questions. I'll do one from the, yeah. the stream. This one's funny. If you could sit next to anyone on a 12-hour plane ride, who would you choose, dead or alive? Ah. Something totally different. You know, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, like someone close, like my parents or like some, you know, it's just uh, some family. Oh, it's okay. just, uh, you never realize, uh, you know, uh, that you never have enough quality time with the closest people, so Your I, I'm always go back to the uh, to the basics. All right, nice nice answer, of course. Yes. Hi. Um, how do you choose your new project, or like what story you're going to tell next? Yeah, it's it's a good it's a good point. It's it's um, it's rarely because of um, uh, like. We being approached, we want you to work on that issue or this or that. It's more like I travel, I always have ears on onto what's happening. I always look at the things. I love to travel and discover new contexts. Sometimes I have an idea, but it might take 10 years. And then sometimes I just feel, I listen to my instinct, it's the right moment to do it, and I just go in it. But there's moments where literally I don't know what's next. And most of the time, I just don't know. And I kind of like that, not knowing what's coming, because it's much more interesting not knowing what's the next step because it means that everything's possible. So you would have asked me uh, a week before I end up in a prison if what's your next project? I had no idea and suddenly I was deep into this project for two years. And now at this moment? And at this moment I'm still in this project. I'm flying back next month there. Um, so you're going back to the prison to the in prison, uh, San yeah. Francisco. We had the yeah. permit right after COVID so I already went back yeah. and I'm going back in there and to do another project within another big yard in the same prison to keep seeing the impact on, keep seeing inmates being released, the impact yeah. it had on their life, how they reconnected with their family. There's hundreds of stories one by one, you can yeah. take them and you realize how the project impacted them. Mm. But sometimes, you know, my dream is that I would have zero idea for one year. <laughs> I, I ah. kind of dream of that. <laughs> but each time you're like, oh, we should do this and we go and do it, but what is, really. What is your craziest idea? Well, you no, like so which, which, have, which is not possible at the moment. What is like well, I, the crazy thing is, I don't really thing. think like that. When I have a crazy idea, I just go and do it. I can't hold on it. So I just, I, I really always wait for like, I can't hold. You know, when the prison happened and I got that permit, I flew the next day. I didn't wait it a week, two weeks, and we did it so fast. There was no emergency for it. We just wanted to do it the fastest possible, and lucky we were because COVID hit it. Mm -hmm. I always walk like if it's my last day tomorrow. I I've, I've don't take the, for granted that, oh yeah, let's do this in two years or this. How come? I don't know. It's something that I always had, the emergency of things, like if you don't know if there's a tomorrow, and I do that for all, everything. And so I, and now I think, I was like, I'm so glad I did because, well, the governor is still the same today, but now they forbid me to enter with the phone. Like things ah. have changed quickly. But COVID happened and we couldn't enter in the prison for like a year and a half. Like, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. So even when we had the permit, we're like, let's just go and do it right now. Do it now. straight away. Um, I think there's, yeah, there's one. Let me see how many questions we yeah. have. Oh, there's more coming in on the live stream. Hold on. Um, you work a lot with people from the community, yeah. um, what I really love. This is from Mohammed Yusuf Bas, a dancer and artistic director from Groningen. My question for you is, how do you engage with them? Well, very simply, you know, I just... 
walk to them and talk to them. It's uh, <laughs> in a very simple way. Often, uh, you know, people are curious or shy. I'm shy too. So often the project is a good excuse. I go and say, well, look, this is, you know, what and I love to do. And being curious, right? It's about being curious. Yeah, being curious, but because other. truly I am curious because often I go and if I had to do a project here, I, I know, you know, almost nothing about the city. So I want to know, tell me about what had happened. Mm -hmm. And I want to understand, but often I had a hard time at, at school to learn about places that I've never been to mm -hmm. and, and just on the school book. But when I go there and I ask people, then suddenly everything becomes, you know, I see it, I understand it, and then I become, I never forget it. Yeah. But if I read it on a book, it won't like necessarily stick to my mind. Did, did you grow up with art at school? How, how, no, or? never. I didn't no. even know who was Warhol, Basquiat. I didn't even know like <laughs> nothing. So even when I started and people say, oh, your walk looks like Keith Saring. Like, who's that? I have no idea who that is. <laughs> I only knew the gra graffiti writers from, you know, my neighborhood. Literally, I had no idea that there was a museum, galleries. I, I thought that the biggest art gallery so was... So you were doing the, Diego Riviera, but you didn't oh, know... No, no, was. Diego Riviera came on like 15 <laughs> okay. years later. No, no, yeah. you have to understand, I knew nothing. And yeah. still, I, you know, I'm still discovering a lot of artists. People say, oh, you should know about this artist. I'm still in that process of learning, and I feel I'll be there for my whole life because, I, you know, I can't catch up on all of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I, I just, as many books as I can find, as many stories as I can hear... But uh, often it's fascinating because you realize that at some other period, some artists have done a similar approach in yeah. a different way. And so you're like, oh, wow, you know, it's, it's crazy. But I didn't grow up with Cartier-Bresson or Duano or this. And, mm -hmm. and the black and white. when I discovered it, I was fascinated. But, but okay, maybe not like the, the classical art, if, 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 which is um, portrayed in museums, but art is also uh, music, um, oh, film. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. Who influenced you? Uh, well, graffiti... Uh, the movie called Hate. It's a black and white movie. Yeah. Hain, yeah. Um, which uh, 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 Matthew Kassovitz. Yeah. Oh. Um, you know, uh, yeah. things like that. That suddenly, like, it was black and white. I was 13 years old. I've never seen a movie in black and white. And then I was talking about a context I know. I was just like, what, what did I just saw? But I realized it later. Yeah. I didn't realize And music-wise? And music-wise, at the time, I was just listening to other, you know, like, uh, uh, instrumentals, very, like, cinematographic music or rap, you know, one or the other. And, uh, and then I expanded to electronics, to like, uh, it's, and, and now it's a huge part. Music has always been a big part because I always, even when I shoot, I always have a headphone. I have a music in one of the headphones. And if not, we have it in the truck, but I always have music on. What are you listening uh, uh, to at the moment? <sighs> um, what am I listening? I mean, I don't know, constant. Well, uh, there's, uh, you know, in France we have a group called The Blaze and one of the two called Guillaume Malric. He just released something just now, like... Is, it, is it rap? Uh, no, it's electronic. Yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine did a Area 21. Amazing. It's, the, you know, from here in the US. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I listen and it can go in a very wide range. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe you want to pick out the last one, time-wise. <laughs> That's been it. The last, uh, last question, if you need my help. So if you go... Did you, uh, did you ever walk in Holland? That's a good one. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually um, walked in, in Amsterdam as one of my... Maybe my first time I was invited to a museum show was not in the museum, but on the outside of the museum. And it was at FOAM in... Uh, the famous uh, uh, photography uh, museum in, in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. Yeah. I was so proud because it was like the first time, I think. And so I pasted the outside of the museum with the face-to-face -face project. And I pasted also in the CD big portraits from that project. Uh, and so that was my first time in Holland in 2007. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't even know how to blow up posters that big. So I had to figure out. Which is your trademark now. Yeah, but at the time I had done it just strips of paper on flat walls, like on the wall in Israel, Palestine, but I would only look at flat walls. Yeah. And here they gave me buildings that had windows and like old bricks. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, I'll take it. But I had no idea how to do it. So it took me hours to do it. Oh, wow. And so it was the but, first time you did this in, in Holland. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank you. JR, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much, and good luck with everything. And uh, please visit the exhibition. I will. Thank you, Groninger Museum. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is it.